professors, doctors and visitors who are watching us now, Women in Cardiology webinar. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to the Women, Women in Cardiology webinar. This is the first webinar that we organize special for International Women's Day. We aim to organize Women in Cardiology webinar on the same day at the same time in every year. The Women in Cardiology webinar is planned as a non-profit webinar special for women development and inspiration. We establish as a training and education company. We design and organize accredited educational and procedural trainings in all over the world. We work together with many specialties and we are using different learning pathways. This is why we would like to organize a webinar which includes a great scientific topics special for women. These great topics will be represented uh, will be presented by greatest women cardiologists from all over the world today. This is a short program for celebrate for being together. International Women's Day is celebrated globally to honor uh, the achievements of women in the field of social, medical, political, and economic. We are proud with women whose work on science and healthcare area. This celebration is organized to give an honor uh, to give an honor uh, to our great cardiologists from all over the world. Celebrated on 8th of March every year, the signific significance uh, of International Women's Day is increasing year after year and has become a custom today. It appears as a celebration of respect, appreciation, love, and care towards women. It's glad to know that Women's Day is also celebrated in colleagues and schools nowadays, which instill respect and care for women in the minds of young brains since their childhood itself. It also forms an essential part of the curriculum in some schools in order to, in order to, order to spread the knowledge and awareness of women empowerment, their position in the society and their achievements. I have been given this opportunity to host the program, and I'm extremely glad to, uh, since this, this is an opportunity for me to thank all those women who have played an important role in my life. I would like to say thank to all these ladies on the International Days, uh, on the International Women's Days. I always thank them for being in my life and shaping it, it the way uh, it is today my mother, my grannies, aunties, our neighbors, and my precious uh, professors who are important women in my life, who have not only made me a better person and supported me through thick and thin, but they also inspired me to be an inspirational leader and scientific woman. In fact, all the women colleagues and staffs here, irrespective uh, of your position and posts, our wonderful creation of God, because you not only manage your area well, but also ensure that every need of your house and family is met perfectly. That is the reason we always emphasize giving due honor to the women in their life, because I understand you well as a woman leader. Women need respect, care, support, and motivation from us. Today's woman is no longer a dependent soul. She is independent and self-reliant in every respect and is capable of doing everything. Let's recognize the importance of women's existence and motivate them and ourselves for future, future achievements. Thank you for joining us today. Now, I would like to present to you Professor Dr. Alev Arat Özkan. She will present us female patients in Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be with you with such distinguished uh, female cardiologist. My topic is a female patient in cat lab, and I will try to summarize you what we know if you have a female patient on the table. 
So what do we know? We know female patients are older, they have higher prevalence of comorbidities, they have smaller vessel size, smaller radial arteries prone to spasm. They have different platelet activities and they are uh, prone to higher bleeding risk. There are hormonal influences and there's a stronger inflammatory milieu in women and uh, they uh, have more catheter-induced spasm. And in uh, general, they are more prone to complications. And in case of acute coronary syndrome, again, they are older, they are more diabetic, and frailty is a problem, uh, especially in those older than 75 years old. And we know that uh, female patients need longer triage times and they have longer door to balloon times. And plaque erosion is more common than plaque rupture. And one important point, younger women have higher risk of death when they are on the table, especially if they present with an acute coronary syndrome. So what kind of angiographic findings we see? They have smaller vessel size, more tortuosity. They have low plaque burden and more diffuse disease. They have strong flow mediated dilatation, higher FFR values. Uh, and one quarter of all complex PCI cases are done in women. And these include 20% of them include at least one bifurcation lesion. And if we perform a complex uh, intervention in a female patient, we know that they have uh, more frequent periprocedural MI, uh, higher rates of coronary dissection, and higher rates of 30-day mortality. And in most cases, unfortunately, they don't have these uh, atherosclerotic obstruction. In less than half of the patients, we have such an obstruction. Actually, if we have an atherosclerotic obstruction, as you can see here on the left side, there's a tortuous vessel with obstruction in mid LAD. This was a calcific lady. And here I know what to do. I put a stent here, and if it's a chronic coronary syndrome, uh, the symptoms may improve, and it's an acute one, then I know the prognosis will be improved. But this is unfortunately not always the case. Sometimes the patient has ischemic symptoms, but we have normal or near normal coronary arteries, as you can see here. And sometimes we had spontaneous coronary artery dissection uh, in acute coronary syndromes in uh, female patients. 90% of all SCAD cases are female, and 40% of uh, pregnancy-related ischemic syndromes are due to spontaneous coronary artery dissection. In such a case, this is relatively easy to diagnose the uh, spontaneous dissection, but it's not always like that. Sometimes we have only intramural hematoma and we don't see a flap, we can't see the dissection. It looks like an atherosclerotic obstruction. So we have to work up to find out the underlying pathophysiology. And we have to uh, further investigate either with ventriculography, with provocative testing, we have to assess microvascular function or we have to use intravascular imaging. Regarding intracoronary imaging, uh, you know, it's not uh, only necessary for uh, finding out the underlying pathophysiology or the uh, plaque characteristics. We also use it to uh, assess the vessel size, to choose the stem size, and then to assess the uh, position of the stem. But as you can see here uh, in this study, uh, women receive less intravascular imaging compared to men. Actually, both genders receive less uh, imaging than recommended. In all recommended indications, it's nearly 10 to 20 percent. The only uh, uh, in only left main PCI, it reads 50 percent the usage of intravascular imaging. Regarding functional assessment, we know that women have higher FFR values compared to men, but they have similar IFR values. And uh, the FAME sub-study showed us, uh, or suggested, I should say, that men and women get similar benefits from FFR-guided strategies. But this study showed us that uh, women do better when deferred with an FFR-guided strategy compared to men. They have less POCO free uh, POCO, and they have a better survival rate, as you can see here. So, which means that we need women-specific cutoff points, actually, or gender-specific cutoff points. 
Sometimes in calcific lesions, in female patients, we have to use the bulking. Uh, this is a study with rotational arthrectomy, and you can see that bleeding complications and coronary dissections is uh, seen higher in female patients. In general, complications are well described in observational studies, and you can see here that women have 20% more uh, adjusted odds uh, for in-hospital mortality, and the highest is for bleeding complications with 80% increase in odds. This is used now in similar frequency in men and women. This was not the case at the beginning. And this study uh, looked for the 10-year outcomes after PCI with this and included nearly 10,000 uh, patients. Nearly one quarter of them were uh, women. And through 10-year uh, follow-up after PCI, uh, it showed us that female patients are increased uh, at increased risk of early MI in the first month especially. They receive fewer repeat revascularizations and there's no difference in cardiovascular mortality compared with male patients. This is another study again, uh, assessing the outcome. Uh, again, uh, there's more than 30,000 patients. This is a pooled analysis of 21 randomized PCI trials. And it showed us that it's uh, contradicting the other trial, the previous one. Uh, yes, female patients uh, have uh, more cardiac death and ischemia-driven uh, TLR. Uh, they make worse compared to men. And uh, this study also showed the multivariable analysis that female gender is an independent predictor of males. But of course, we know there are other studies showing that it is not. So there are many controversies because there are so many parameters, all of which we can't include in the multivariable analysis. Uh, what I think is interesting is one parameter, then uh, it is interventionist sex. Does it impact on coronary outcomes? And uh, as you can see here uh, in this uh, study, there's no different, uh, difference in risk-adjusted in-hospital mortality between female and male operators. But as you can see on the right upper uh, table, female interventional cardiologists more frequently performed PCI rated as appropriate, and they had a higher likelihood of prescribing guideline-directed medical therapy, as you can see here in the case of aspirin and statin. So, Concluding, what we need is female sex-specific data, we need sex-specific diagnostic criteria and cutoff values, as well as strategies and medic medication, and sex-specific guideline recommendations. And of course, we need more female cardiologists and more female interventionists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. So, uh, thank you for your amazing topic. And I want to introduce to uh, Professor Dr. Angela Moss, and uh, she's from the Netherlands. And I will invite her for presenting her topic. So welcome, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for being invited to this uh, very nice uh, webinar. Uh, and I want to, uh, to say that we all feel very sorry also in our country for the huge damage uh, that has been done to Turkey by the earthquake quakes. We feel very sorry for that. So, so, so. thank you. Uh, sure. My slides. You. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, I'd like to discuss with you uh, Inoka and coronary vasomotor disorders. Inoka means ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries. We all know that uh, there are uh, that sex and gender in uh, medicine is not the same. Sex accounts more for difference in uh, bio biology, uh, genetic issues, hormonal issues, um, uh, and and physiolo physiological differences that do exist among men and women. And gender is more related to positioning in society. Um, uh, financial, cultural problems, etc. And 
both uh, sides of the coin uh, affect uh, cardiovascular disease and are one of the reasons that uh, cardiology uh, has been very male oriented and uh, that the female patients still lag behind in diagnosis and treatment. If you look at the uh, most important causes of death, this is a slide from the uh, Lancet women's paper that came out uh, two years ago. You can see that cardiovascular disease is a 10 times more uh, 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 highly risk of death uh, compared to breast cancer, for instance. If you ask women themselves, they may mention breast cancer, but cardiovascular disease is the main cause of death in women worldwide. Many changes do occur uh, when women enter menopause. We know that before menopause, that estrogens have many beneficial effects on the coronary uh, and other uh, vessels. They reduce oxidative stress. They are the most perfect vasodilators, but we see a lot of changes when women enter their 50s. You can see here that levels of estrogens already uh, lower when women pass the age of 30. And what we see in, in the course of time that uh, sympathic tone uh, is higher, that levels of uh, lipids um, are higher, blood pressure rises more in elderly women compared to uh, elderly men. Uh, there's more inflammation in women and there's also a shift in the thrombotic system. So there are many changes related to uh, uh, menopause that do account for a higher risk when uh, women uh, get older. So in cardiology, what we have done over the past decades, in fact, over the past 40 years, we have focused on structural coronary artery disease. We have developed uh, PCI techniques, coronary bypass surgery, and we have reduced uh, the death rates of myocardial infarction from, from 25 to less than uh, 4% uh, in all patients. Uh, but we have uh, forgotten about functional coronary uh, artery disease and also coronary microvascular disorders. And we are quite happy that over the past five to seven years, coronary vasomotor disorders have been and uh, have become an important topic in cardiology because this more affects our female patients. We know that there are important differences in uh, plaques among men and women. Uh, men have uh, a larger lipid core, uh, more calcification compared to women. And you see this also back when you perform a coronary calcium score that normal values for women at all ages are lower compared to men. And we know now that the pattern of atherosclerosis is quite different among men and women, specifically in the age group between 40 and 70 years. So this is for at least uh, 30 years uh, uh, in women's life. Uh, women more often have spasm in the apicardial and microvascular vessels. Um, of all patients, 80% uh, are women. And this is the opposite if you look at obstructive coronary disease, about 75 to 80% are men. So these are important differences in the pattern of uh, coronary aging among men and women. And um, there are many um, different phenotypes of patients. Um, uh, many patients, women, do have a bit of atherosclerosis, not significant. Uh, uh, in addition, they have epicardial spasm and microvascular dysfunction. But there are also uh, patients who only have microvascular dysfunction and no, at least no visible atherosclerosis. So there are many differences in phenotypes of patients. And we know now that it's very important to establish ex exactly uh, which phenotype the patients are 
because treatment may be different and also the reaction for medical therapy, which is often needed, is different if you have only epicardial vasospasm compared to only microvascular dysfunction. So uh, this is an example of uh, a young uh, woman. She had symptoms for many years. She had visited uh, several cardiologists and in the end she was sent to a psychiatrist because nobody understood her symptoms. And uh, in, uh, the psychiatrist also didn't understand her symptoms. And what we did, we did an acetylcholine uh, test in this woman. She was only 46. And you can see here um, that uh, uh, with infusion, oh, sorry, uh, with infusion of only two micrograms of acetylcholine that she had severe constriction in her left coronary artery. And this is after nitroglyceride. You can see that she had perf perfect, uh, uh, at least uh, on vision, uh, coronary arteries without any visible obstructive disease. So it's important if you have uh, patients uh, without obstructive disease, and you can now uh, establish that quite easily with a CT scan and uh, in addition, a CT angiogram, if you don't find any reason for, uh, uh, for the symptoms, it is important to do an initial uh, coronary function test. And we started with this uh, uh, at the Radboud University in Nijmegen, where I work um, uh, now four years ago. So we have done hundreds of patients from all over the country and even outside the country. And we see a lot of... Um, epicardial spasm as the main cause of uh, chest pain in those women with min misunderstood symptoms. It's often said that women have atypical symptoms, but I prefer to say that women have very characteristic symptoms for the underlying problem that they have. If you have coronary spasm, you have a kind of crescendo, decrescendo type of symptoms. Uh, it increases and it decreases over time. Um, so it's a fluctuating pain. It can be present at rest and during exercise. Shortness, shortness of breath is often reported. Extreme tiredness, but also we see an important role of mental stress. If there is a lot of mental stress, uh, those patients will have more uh, symptoms. Uh, luckily, in 2020, there has uh, been published uh, a European guideline, uh, also with the, the limitations that are still uh, present, the INOCA guideline. There are also now US guidelines, and in the near future, there will come uh, uh, more, uh, more position papers and guidelines uh, of the European Society of uh, Cardiology. So we're making a lot of progress over the past few years uh, in understanding what exactly happens in this kind of uh, INOCA patients. We have to bear in mind that what we see in a normal coronary angiography is only the tip of the iceberg. We can never uh, demonstrate the whole uh, microvascular tour. Uh, uh, this is uh, an image of uh, a pig, uh, a dead pig, uh, but we can never show this in life. So uh, at the moment, there are very good catheters to, uh, to measure uh, resistance in the microvascular tour uh, to determine what exactly is the cause of symptoms in affected women. So um, invasive coronary assessment and uh, coronary function testing is now uh, the gold standard uh, in those patients without obstructive disease. Uh, you first do a coronary ang angiography, then you measure uh, CFR and index of microvascular resistance. Then you do uh, a vasoreactivity testing and there are excellent protocols uh, with very low risk at the moment. We didn't have, I think we did now about six or 700 patients. We haven't had one lethal um, uh, complication. Some smaller complications, but no severe problems. And it is important because the medicine that uh, uh, is given 
is different if you have microvascular angina as the primary cause of symptoms or um, a spasm as the other primary cause of symptoms. Uh, for instance, beta blockers uh, do best in microvascular angina. And when you have epicardial spasm or microvascular spasm, uh, uh, calcium antagonists are the first choice of treatment. And you give it in very high dosages that uh, uh, it's often a problem uh, when people go to a pharmacist because the pharmacists think that you made a mistake and they're not used to this kind of dosages. But I do have patients um, who have two times a day 600 milligram of diltiazem, and many of them feel very good uh, with the, this kind of dosages. But it's not suited for every patient. So you have to uh, determine the exact phenotype and see what patients can have and what they not can have. Here you see the, the different kinds of medications, uh, again, the preferences. And what we often do is also a combination of, um, uh, of medication. For instance, you can combine a low dose of selective beta blockers with calcium antagonist in patients who are below 70. If you do it in the older age group, you can have uh, um, uh, disturbances, uh, uh, a block, um, 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 a, a, a total block or whatever. But if you do it in the below uh, 70 uh, patients, it, in most cases, it's not a problem. Important is also uh, to learn patients to cope with stress. We have a separate nurse at our, our patient clinic who helps the patient, who talks to the patients to learn to live with this kind of chronic disease because it is a chronic disease. We can't solve the problem, but we can learn the patients uh, to, to live with this uh, problem. What we now also do, we do uh, a kind of uh, uh, investigation with an app of the smart, uh, on smartphone of patient to look whether um, uh, a stress reducing program, we do this with biofeedback, with wearables. Um, uh, uh, if patients are very stressed, they get a signal and then they do uh, uh, some uh, stress reducing um, exercises uh, with their iPhone. So this is one way also to learn patients at home to deal with stress and to deal with their uh, symptoms. And this is still work in progress, not so easy, uh, but this is a kind of innovation in uh, cardiology. So I'd like to, uh, to end that it's very important to treat those patients because if we don't, um, patients uh, can be prone to have a minoca, a myocardial infarction. So uh, this kind of chronic inoca patients with coronary vasomotor disorders have to be treated also for their risk factors, because if you don't, uh, they are at increased risk to get uh, one or another uh, acute coronary syndrome. I'd like to end, oh no, this, uh, sorry. Uh, this was uh, my last uh, slide for this presentation. Thank you very much. I'm finished. Um, Nazira, uh, Mrs. Nazira, uh, it's not working your voice. You have to open your microphone. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Angela. Um, now I would like to present you uh, Professor Beatrice Vacuerizo. Uh, she, is uh, she will present uh, us CTO in female patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I will... I'm Dr. Vaquerizo from uh, Hospital Del Mar in Barcelona. Um, I'm going to talk about coronary total occlusions in female patients. I'm sorry because I have a little bit of cold, but I try to do my best. 
what we know about coronary artery disease in women, we know that cardiovascular disease is the first cause of death for both men and women. But women more often present with atypical symptoms and it's difficult sometimes to make a good diagnosis. And maybe it's the reason because are less likely to be referred to coronary angiography, also in acute coronary syndrome. And there is a strong evidence show that women have worse outcomes after myocardial revascularization, both with cabbage and PCI. Regarding CTO in female patients, the presence of a CTO is around 15% of patients with difference between sexes. But CTO revascularization is relatively infrequent in female patients, thus women are underrepresented in CTO PCA registries and clinical trials. So it's true that we don't have a lot of data regarding comparing male and female in CTO PCI. And to me, these three factors are relating because CTO revascularization is relatively infrequent in female patients, so we don't have a lot of patients in the study, so we don't have a lot of uh, data in this uh, group of patients in CTO. In addition, CTO-PCA, successful CTO-PCA is related with improvement of angina, dyspnea, quality of life, depression, ischemia, and physical performance. But until now, there is not improvement of hard clinical outcomes. In addition, in patients with CTO, the main symptom is dyspnea, more often than angina. And there is a strong bias to study female patients with atypical angina. This may explain the very low percentage of female patients referred to revascularization. In the progress CTO registry, only 19% of 9,000 CTO lesions included were female patients. This trial is interesting because it's quite recent include a lot of centers, a lot of CTO, and is a multi and is, is international. Most of the centers were in USA, but also there were centers in Canada, Greece, Egypt, Lebanon, Russia, and Turkey, and India. The sub-study that studied the female patients included 1,700 CTO, comparing to 7,000 uh, CTOs in male, but you can see cl here the baseline clinical char characteristics and you can see that women were older, more obese, they have more uh, risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, they had previous history of myocardial infarction and PCI and cabbage, and despite the most frequent clinical presentation was angina, they had more, more frequent presentation of and, and, and a stable angina and non STEMI that is quite infrequent in this subset of patients. So, women with CTOs were older, more obese, more diabetes, and the main symptom is dyspnea. So, maybe this is, may explain the very low percentage of female patients referred to revascularization because dyspnea in uh, obese. All women with diabetes sometimes is difficult to understand because could be multifactorial. Regarding lesion and technical characteristics, you can see here the GCT score and progress CT score than for women was less complex the CTOs. And you can see here the access, more access were femoral, and you know that sometimes femoral access has more complications. Here you can see the outcomes. You can compare men in blue and women, and for technical and procedural success, women were higher than men, but for in-hospital men, uh, women has more events than men. In addition, independent predictors of technical success, you can see that women was an independent predictor but also was an independent predictor of maize in hospital maize. When you can, ah, uh, I see that the presentation is not uh, well because it was just behind this, but you can see here in hospital maize from the uh, strong uh, events, there were no difference in mortality. Uh, there were no difference in, in repeat revascularization 
in myocardial infarction, in perforation, and in dissection. But there was difference in a stroke. There was difference in pericardial effusion. There was difference in contrast induced nephropathy and also in vascular complica in access vas vascular complications. Because the CTOs in men were more complex, they used more contrast, they used more radiation, more fluoroscopy, and more procedural time. Here you have the, the typical example. This is a 74 years old female, obese, ex-smoker, a lot of risk factor, hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, COPD, a little bit of renal failure, and the patient was referred for angina dyspnea class 3. The left ventricular ejection fraction was quite, quite normal, and the CT, the CT spec uh, showed moderate to severe anterior myocardial ischemia. We did a CT, CT scan in some CTO patients to prepare the, the PCI, and you can see here that was a severe calcification, was calcified here just in the middle of the CTO. Ah, I'm sorry. Can I share my screen to see the videos? Is it is possible? Okay, I will try. Yes, of course. Of course. One moment. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, we are not. Now not? No. Uh, sorry, let me see. If not, I... Um, can you try again? Yeah. No. Can can you see my screen? Yes, we can see okay. your screen. I go a little bit further. This is the CTO. You can see here, this is the LAD. There is severe calcification. You can see calcium in both sides of the vessel. And this is the Corsair with the filter XT fell to cross the CTO, but the ultimate bros uh, wire crossed successfully the CTO. But the problem that the balloon you can see here was not well expanded. And you can see here that there was no dissection. But we did IBUS, and you can see at the level of the CTO, there was a severe calcification. This, there is a ring with a shadow behind. So we perform rotational atherectomy. And we optimize with cutting balloon, three millimeters cutting balloon predilatation. And this is the result after this. So these are my final comments. The present, the present of CTO is around 15% of the patient with no difference between sex. Sex, women are less frequently referred to CTO recanalization, I think according to their ambiguous presentation. But female gender has a great positive impact on technical and procedural success. There was an independent predictor, but also is important to be careful to avoid the most common complications in women such as cardiac tamponade, access problems, and contrast nephropathy. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, doctor, for your important topic. So I would like to invite uh, Professor Nihan. So welcome, Professor. And Hi, and good evening, everyone. Good evening. And she will be uh, getting present and the hypertension in the woman. So. Okay. So good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Nihan from Istanbul. In this special night, I'm going to talk about hypertension in women. <clears throat> okay. Hypertension is the most common modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease and the leading cause of death in women worldwide. In fact, in America, one in five deaths among women uh, are due to hypertension and that poses a greater burden for women than men. 
but are women uh, less or more uh, related with hypertension? Actually, women are about as likely as men to develop hypertension at some point during their lives. Uh, but the prevalence of hypertension increases with, with age, especially in elderly women. Uh, and elderly women's are, are, are outcomes are uh, worse than men. Uh, that results uh, a greater attributable risk for hypertension in women than in men. When we look at the pathogenesis of hypertension in women, uh, we see some factors related uh, like genetics, sex hormones, uh, menopause, uh, salt sensitivity, and etc. But among them, estrogen is important because we believe that as estrogen uh, plays a role in vascular protective effect in women. Uh, it causes endothelial vasodilation via upregulation of nitric oxide pathway inhibition of brain's central nervous system activity and rust activity. Hypertension affects women in all phases of her life with specific characteristics. Young women are protected from developing hypertension, uh, especially due to endogenous estrogen. But as women age, they become more likely to develop hypertension. Uh, also, women have some unique forms of hypertension, like uh, during pregnancy, uh, because of using oral contraceptives, assisted reproductive technologies, menopause, or hormone replacement therapy. Uh, besides, analysis of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data by sex reveals that women have lower daytime and non-dipping BPs compared with men. Uh, moreover, white coat hypertension occurs more com commonly in women than men. Uh, and unfortunately, sex-specific long-term cardiovascular disease risk of these individuals has not been clearly defined. Uh, when we look at the adolescent women, we see that sex-specific risk factors again may be the reason for uh, development of premature uh, hypertension. For example, migraine has been associated with hypertension and migraine headaches occur more in uh, uh, adolescent women than in men, especially during premenstrual cycles. Besides, uh, some secondary hypertension types are more uh, observed in women than men, like uh, fibromuscular dis dysplasia, Turner syndrome, or primary hyperaldosteronism. In young women uh, who have estrogen imbalance, premature ovarian insufficiency, because or, uh, or on infertility treatment, they are at uh, increased risk of hypertension. In Women's Health Initiative, they found that recurrent miscarriage was associated with a uh, high risk for hypertension. Contraceptives and contraceptive-related hypertension is another issue. Uh, potential causes of this is uh, due to the estrogen-induced rust stimulation, sodium retention, and increased arterial stiffness. Contraceptive-related hypertension is usually mild and results with discontinuation, and the risk increases with age, tobacco use, obesity, and duration of usage. Uh, we have to mention about salt-sensitive uh, blood pressure in women also. Women uh, are more salt-sensitive than men. It has been shown by many studies. And uh, menos, menopause uh, exacerbates this uh, severity and prevalence of SSPP uh, because uh, female sex chromodo, chromosomes predispose to and female sex hormones mitigate SSPP. Uh, besides aldosterone levels and endothelial mineral corticoid receptor expression is elevated in women uh, uh, and also in salt sensitive hypertension, so there has to be a link. So uh, in this manner, uh, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists may be a preferential treatment for women who, ha uh, who have salt sensitive hypertension. Several studies support a positive relationship between menopause and hypertension. These tables uh, are from our national registry. The dark uh, thick bars represent women, represent women. And as we can see, as women age, the prevalence of hypertension uh, is increases. And the other uh, table shows that uh, in menopausal age of women, we see that uh, both systolic and diastolic uh, BPs are higher than men. There are obvious factors that influence hypertension in menopause. Uh, age is the primary one, 
and by aging, estradiol levels uh, are diminished and estrogen to uh, testosterone ratio is decreased. Uh, that causes endothelial dysfunction, increased soul sensitivity, and uh, increased renal vascular tone. Weight gain is a known factor for hypertension, and unfortunately, we women uh, gain weight when we uh, get old. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, genetic factors are uh, important. Hypertension is known to, uh, to be a multigenetic disorder, but in menopause in particular, uh, some sus suspicious genes might be uh, expressed more. Defining hypertension during pregnancy is based on general population thresholds. Therefore, hypertension is diagnosed in pregnancy uh, when systolic BP is higher than 140 and or diastolic is higher than 90 uh, millimeter mercury, at least twice measured. Hypertension is, uh, in uh, pregnancy can be divided into five categories and the nomenclature depends on the timing of the first diagnosis of hypertension and the persistence of high BP after the delivery. Uh, in pre-existing or chronic hypertension is set when the hypertension is present before week 20 of gestation and persists uh, after 12 weeks of post-gestation. Gestational hypertension is set when high BP is first uh, detected after 20 weeks of gestation. Preeclampsia uh, is set when the hypertensive uh, women have proteinuria and uh, or end organ dysfunction. Uh, Pre-existing hypertension can also be superimposed with preeclampsia. And if hypertension is first diagnosed after 20 weeks of gestation and it's unclear when it was started, then antenatally unclassifiable hypertension diagnosis is made but in this situation, reassessment after six weeks postpartum is needed. The decision to treat hypertension during pregnancy should include consideration of risks and benefits for both the mother and the fetus. Severe hypertension should always be treated to reduce risk of maternal pulmonary edema, stroke, or placental abruption. But we have to be careful about aggressive BP lowering uh, because it may compromise uh, both fetuses and uh, mother's life. <coughs> the threshold for initiation of antihypertensive medications is 150 to 95 in pre-existing hypertension and 140 to 90 in gestational or uh, preeclampsia according to ASC guidelines. Uh, BP decline uh, over the first trimester and early second trimester is generally observed, so we may think of stopping or reducing medications, but actually there are no evidence-based recommendations for tapering BP medications. Only Canadian guidelines recommend tapering drugs when BP declines to 130 to 80 millimeter mercury. Uh, besides, there are no randomized trials supporting any therapy goals in hypertensive pregnant women. But the ACOG recommends uh, maintaining systolic blood pressure 120 to 160 and diastolic blood pressure to 180 uh, and 105. In, uh, there is only one trial that uh, seeked that see less uh, tight or tight. Uh, uh, blood control during pregnancy. In this trial, uh, they they wanted diastolic. The one group uh, had tight control. Target diastolic BP was 85 mm, millimeter mercury, and uh, less tight group targeted diastolic BP to be uh, 100. Uh, and they found no difference in either maternal or fetal outcomes. But uh, in the less tight group they have significantly more cases of severe maternal hypertension. CHAP project is a uh, randomized large population uh, project that evaluated uh, the benefits and harms of treatment of mild chronic hypertension in pregnancy. Uh, they uh, randomized uh, patients into active treatment and control group, and the primary outcome was composed of PE, preterm birth, placental eruption, or fetal or neonatal death, 
Uh, and primary outcome was significantly lower in the treatment group than the control group. Uh, evidence is limited uh, about hypertension treatment in pregnancy due to lack of randomized controlled trials examining efficacy and safety. We know that all antihypertensive drugs across, uh, cross the placenta. There are no uh, FDA risk category A antihypertensive drugs for pregnancy. The most used hydrochlorothiazide, methyldopa, and chlorotriazone are category B, and nifedipine, labetalol, or hydrolysin are category C drugs that are used. Limiting weight gain in overweight and obese uh, pregnant women is generally recommended, although effects on BP control are, are unknown. Uh, similarly, roles of the DASH diet and sodium restriction are also unknown, but the ACOG recommends against very low sodium diet as it may induce low intravascular volume. Hypertension of any type during pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of future cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and current uh, kidney disease. Preeclamptic women have fourfold risk of uh, chronic hypertension. Uh, and as we know, endothelial dysfunction plays a central pathogenic role in PE, and it may persist for years postpartum. So we have to follow up these patients, but for how long? Actually, there are no recommendations for duration of postpartum BP monitoring in pregnancy-related hypertension, but generally, annual BP measurement is uh, recommended. <clears throat> uh, beyond Pregnancy, current evidence supports similar BP thresholds for initiating treatment, BP targets, and choices of antihypertensives for women and men, with exceptions because of sex-specific adverse effects of some antihypertensives. More intensive treatment of hypertension is uh, nowadays generally uh, recommended, uh, depending on large trials such as Cyprin, and Cyprin enrolled more than 3,000 women, so same BP goals are applied for men and women based on sprint and other meta-analyzes data. Sex, uh, there are obvious sex-related differences in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics uh, of drugs uh, because sex hormones interact with metabolizing enzymes and transported proteins. One example for this can be given with metoprolol in hypertension patients a greater decrease in BP with metoprolol was observed in women versus men. Uh, in simulation models, it has been shown that uh, or suggested that 50 mg dose in women uh, provides similar metoprolol exposure uh, to a 100 mg dose in men. Uh, and in fact, oral contraceptives may re result in high plasma metoprolol levels, so we have to be careful. Uh, likewise, with equivalent doses of verapamil, women have higher plasma levels than men. With lifestyle modification alone, BP control is worse in women than men. Salt restriction has theoretical benefits in women, uh, and in DASH trial, uh, there was a pronounced antihypertensive effect in women with dietary sodium restriction. Uh, weight loss may be beneficial in elderly hypertensive women, as I mentioned before, and reducing alcohol consumption has a dose-dependent manner in uh, reducing uh, BP. And uh, exercise reduces arterial stiffness and eventually BP in women as it is in men. Women uh, experience more adverse effects uh, from cardiovascular drugs than men, and the effects tend to be more severe. Randomized control trials report uh, sex-specific adverse profiles for some antihypertensives. For example, uh, women experience more frequent edema, edema with uh, calcium channel blockers, more cough with ACE inhibitors, more arrhythmia, hyponatremia, and hypokalemia with the diuretics, and more minoxidil-related hirsutism is observed in women. Uh, but luckily, uh, thiazid diuretics uh, may provide benefit regarding bone loss in elderly women via calcium metabolism. Hypertension control rates appear higher in women than men, uh, but in elderly women, control is less than men, unfortunately. Uh, 
Uh, in a uh, Spanish registry, they evaluated sex differences in hypertension control uh, and found that while in office BP uh, control was similar in women and men, ambulatory blood pleasure monitoring shows significantly higher control rates in women than in men. I want to uh, finish my present presentation with uh, further research. Uh, further research is needed to understand sex-specific outcomes associated with various hypertension uh, phenotypes to define ideal thresholds, BP goals, and associated clinical outcomes in women, and to treat hypertension during and after pregnancy and understand the effects of BP treatment on maternal and fetal outcomes. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor. So uh, I want to invite to Professor uh, Meral Kayıkcıoğlu for the primary and secondary prevention in the female patients. And hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, can I have my slides, please? Uh, of course. Here. Okay. So it's so nice to be all together uh, for uh, the International uh, Women's Day uh, webinar. Uh, my presentation topic is primary and secondary cardiovascular prevention in the female. And I, I cannot control it. Can I help me to control the slides? Of course. Sorry. Is there a problem? Well, so it is uh, well addressed uh, in the previous uh, presentations that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer, both in men and women, but almost half of all the women's death are due to cardiovascular disease. And when we compare to, sorry, but I cannot succeed to go, okay. Uh, when we compare to the melanin C's, uh, because most of the women think that the breast cancer is the number one killer of women uh, all around the world. Almost every one in two women will die because of uh, cardiovascular disease. And this ratio is one in six for breast cancer. And uh, in a recent uh, survey uh, that we presented in the recent ACC meeting, uh, in almost 8,000 individuals in Tur Turkey, uh, we asked, uh, what is the, ask about the number one killer in women uh, and checked for the awareness uh, both in men and uh, women. And we see that um, only uh, one third uh, of women and men were aware that uh, cardiovascular disease uh, affect on mortality in women. And there was no correlation with the education level uh, uh, in this awareness in our study. And the problem is, uh, as we see in our study, uh, there are some misperceptions that uh, heart disease is believed to be a men's problem only. And many people think that only older women have heart disease. And another might is that estrogen protects women from heart disease. But uh, again, well addressed in the previous presentations, estrogen and sex hormones uh, affect uh, arteries uh, in women and make them more elastic, uh, more smaller in size, and more reactive with the increased inflammation. So in case if there's a risk factor is present, then the protective effect uh, of this uh, sex hormones uh, becomes harmful. Uh, if I see, uh, if I present it in a um, figure that uh, at the top of the normal arteries and uh, you see here the men's and the women's arteries, especially the young woman, uh, the, with the effect of the estrogen, the plaques grow uh, with uh, eccentric remodeling, leading to atypical symptoms, more vascular dysfunction, 
uh, more non-obstructive lesions and more diffuse arterial sclerosis associated with less calcification and more softer uh, plugs in women compared to men. And this affects and misbeliefs in young women uh, about the risk factors leads to less preventive measures, atypical symptoms, more difficult diagnosis, leading to late diagnosis, late treatment, and less aggressive treatment uh, that all could be associated with higher mortality in women than in men. And in the Turkish MI study, which was a registry for the countrywide uh, cardiology, invasive cardiology centers, uh, we showed that mortality in patients with ST elevation MI uh, was extremely higher. It's about three times higher in hospital period in women compared to men. And during the uh, year following the index myocardial infarction, uh, the mortality was again two times higher uh, in women compared to men. And when we look at the ischemic time gaps, uh, the total ischemic time uh, was significantly longer in the in women. And the most important thing here leading to uh, this time gap was the late in seeking medical care, as we see with this time with from the initiation of the symptom to EMS call. Uh, and this was 30 minutes late in women. And the time gap, gap between the door to balloon time was only five minutes uh, between men and women. And the risk profile also was very different between men and women in the secondary prevention in the MI patients. Mostly women were more diabetic, more hypertensive, and uh, only the risk factor was smoking that was less prevalent in uh, women with MI. And the risk factor profile was also different in the prevention, primary prevention patients in Turkey. As you can see from this uh, figure that uh, not only hypertension, obesity, diabetes, but also hypercholesterolemia was more prevalent in women compared to men, also including this, this for metabolic syndrome. And when we look at these all traditional risk factors, they are very really well recognized, but there are also emerging risk, emerging risk factors associated with a uh, woman's higher mortality. These are depression, stress, and autoimmune diseases, and also oncological treatments, cardio, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and environmental pollution are among them. And also there are some unique cardiovascular risk factors for uh, women uh, associated with them, uh, again, uh, hormonal change, including early menopause, hormonal therapy, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and so on. And uh, across the life course of a woman, all these reproductive factors affect the risk of developing cardiovascular risk factors. This is a very well-known factor. And when we look at the uh, plaque shearing factor, plaque progression, we see that in addition to the estrogen effects, all these risk factors uh, contribute to uh, the plaque progression in women. And besides these specific risk factors, there are also some gender uh, related factors such as, such as social determinants, uh, that are uh, personal and social stereotypes, uh, personal and social perception of the uh, uh, masculine and feminine roles and etc. that's affecting the mortality, uh, both in primary and pre uh, secondary prevention for cardiovascular disease in, uh, in women. And moreover, Uh, as we know very well, women uh, have an increased risk of facing abuse, violence, and mobbing all over the world than men. And these uh, social factors uh, are, of course, extreme risk factors, but even they are after the end of these such uh, risk, 
uh, there is a sustained increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease uh, and we have to be aware of this and of course all these differences also leads to the less uh, and late diagnosis of the woman and the Therefore, uh, abnormal coronary CT angiogram and coronary calcium score are important uh, in uh, showing the greater risk in women. Uh, for example, in, uh, in the PROMISE study, the abnormal CT angiography conferred greater risk in women than abnormal stress test. We have to be sure about this. And also, uh, coronary calcium score uh, predicts cardiovascular risk uh, better in women than men uh, for cardiovascular disease. And what about the treatment? Uh, differences between both uh, sexes. Many countries are trying to address uh, with registries what is the difference of the sex bias in uh, cardiovascular prevention, both in secondary and uh, primary. And of course, depending on the area and social factors, uh, there are many differences, but it is unique that uh, women are undertreated, uh, especially in primary and also in the secondary prevention. For example, in the acute coronary syndromes, women receive less statin therapy uh, and the discontinuation rate is also, as you can see here, higher. Uh, declining of the therapy of the statin therapy is also seems to be higher in women. Uh, and these are very important in probably in their higher mortality rate during the acute coronary events. And I want to say something about also the FH, which is a very increased risk factor for premature myocardial infarction. And unfortunately, uh, though women are have uh, women with FH are at an increased risk of uh, premature mortality, uh, they are diagnosed late in uh, time course, and women are less likely to receive the proper management or attain LDL targets, uh, though they have FH. And the, uh, in, interestingly, the PrEP treatment and untreatment LDL levels in, on, uh, of FH patients are very similar. So women get the same benefit as men uh, from the statin therapy, but the statin intolerance is extremely higher in women when compared to men. Uh, all the other uh, lipid lowering agents, including uh, uh, PCKS9 inhibitors and ezetimibe, also show that women uh, have similar benefit uh, to men uh, in the acute uh, and secondary and primary prevention. Uh, interestingly, Gender differences in cardiovascular risk treatment and outcomes in the diabetic population is also different between men and women. Uh, and this is a very uh, recent paper about 10,000 uh, participants, almost half of them, all of them were women. And although most women meet treatment targets for blood pressure and lipids, uh, this study showed that fewer women uh, than men met the target for cardioprotective therapies, both at baseline and after the two years. And particularly, this was true for uh, uh, women with secondary prevention, and they were using less uh, uh, ACE inhibitors, less statins, and as, uh, less antiplatelet therapy than men. Uh, I cannot, again, go on with the slides. Can you help me? Uh, the efficacy and safety of the lipid lower therapy, for example, with statins, both in primary and pr uh, secondary prevention, was very similar between men and women. Uh, but for antiplatelet agents, we cannot say the, stay, stay the same. 
for primary prevention, the strong evidence is lacking, uh, but for secondary prevention, they seem to be uh, both effective. But the, the hemorrhagic burden in women, in part related to the uh, uh, inappreciated dosing, uh, seems to be high in women. But uh, we have to be sure that women uh, remain underrepresented in cardiovascular trials. This is very extremely important that we don't have data to have uh, stronger evidence uh, uh, in guidelines. Moreover, even the experimental animals used for cardiovascular disease studies are male. And uh, for primary prevention and secondary prevention, the treatment are the same, should be the same between men and women. And we also have to be aware of the cardiovascular risk enhancers specific to women gender and uh, women sex. Uh, and the major barrier is awareness uh, in this topic. So in conclusion, I can say that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer both in men and women and half of women are still dying due to cardiovascular diseases, and the risk factors profile are not the same between men and women, and there are sex and gender-specific factors that should be keep, kept in mind while working with women, and the major barrier is awareness of cardiovascular diseases in women. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for your attendance, Doctor. So uh, I want to invite uh, Dr. Anam, from the USA, and hello, doctor. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Happy Women's Day to everybody. Um, it is a privilege to present with such uh, wonderful leaders in the field. I'm going to be, uh, I'm an advanced imaging fellow at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at, in the US, and I'm gonna be presenting cases that demonstrate the use of cardiac MRI as a diagnostic tool in women. So my first case is that of a 46 year old female with new heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. She was taken to the cath lab and was found to have no obstructive coronary artery disease. And so a cardiac MRI was ordered to um, assess for etiology of her cardiomyopathy. These are SSFB Cine images showing you that her left ventricular function is globally reduced. Her EF uh, is severely reduced, estimated at about uh, 20%. And then there is this heterogeneous material in the LV apex that is discordant from the endocardium, raising concern for an LV apical thrombus. Late gadolinium enhancement images reveal a small amount of late gadolinium enhancement in the basal anteroseptum, inferoseptum, as well as some in the mid inferoseptum. But overall, there, it, this, this pattern of late gadolinium enhancement or scar is consistent with non ischemic cardiomyopathy. There is also this uh, thrombus seen in the LV apex, which is further demonstrated on uh, phase sensitive inversion recovery LGE images in the four chamber view and the two chamber view. So a key point is that cardiac MRI can be used to assess etiology of cardiomyopathy in women. Other examples that you might see um, of, um, of uh, cardiomyopathy causes on cardiac MRI include cardiac amyloidosis, where, the, where there is diffuse late gadolinium enhancement, starts out as subendocardial, and then as disease progresses, it goes into um, a transmural heterogeneous pattern. Um, with extensive late gadolinium enhancement. And the pre and post contrast native T1 times um, give us increased extracellular volume fraction in all segments consistent with cardiac amyloidosis. Another example that you might see is cardiac sarcoidosis. So this was a female patient with pulmonary sarcoidosis who was uh, then having some PVCs on her EKG and then was referred for a cardiac MRI to assess for uh, cardiac involvement. And here we are seeing late gadolinium enhancement uh, in the subepicardial to mid myocardial, basal, inferolateral, and inferior walls. And then we're also seeing this mid myocardial, mid anteroseptum, subepicardial, mid inferior wall, uh, and it's multifocal, it's patchy, it's not in a coronary distribution, and that all raises concern for cardiac sarcoidosis in this case. 
My second case is that of a 69-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with orthopnea and shortness of breath. She had known coronary artery disease with a prior PCI to the LAD previously. Um, on this admission, she was found to have a new cardiomyopathy and an NSTEMI. A cath showed a subtotal LED occlusion and severe OM1 stenosis. But the degree of cardiomyopathy was so severe that she was referred for a cardiac MRI to assess for a stress cardiac MRI to assess for etiology of her cardiomyopathy. We are seeing stress perfusion displayed on top and rest perfusion below. And on the stress perfusion images, you can see that there is a subendocardial perfusion defect in the basal to mid anteroseptum anterior and anterolateral wall as well as apical septum, apical anterior, and some apical component of the apical lateral wall that is predominantly reversible. And this is perhaps highlighted better in the representative still frame images where you can appreciate the subendocardial defect and its reversibility. Late gadolinium enhancement images revealed that there is subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement in the basal to mid anteroseptum anterior and anterolateral wall, but this is less than 25% of myocardial wall thickness, indicating that the LED territory is viable, and there is likely benefit to uh, revascularization of the LED territory. There is also transmural late gadolinium enhancement of the basal to mid infralateral wall, indicating the presence of non-viable scar in the circumflex or OM territory. So here, cardiac MRI allowed us to assess for ischemia in this female as well as assess for myocardial viability. My third case is that of a 56-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with chest pain. She had a history of SLE, a systemic lupus erythematosus, and also had had a recent COVID infection. Her ESR and CRP were elevated, and so a cardiac MRI was ordered to assess for etiology. On the left side, we see uh, cine images of the heart in a four-chamber view. You can see that biventricular function is preserved, but then the, the pericardium is very prominent and thickened. There is a circumferential pericardial effusion. On two T2-weighted edema sequences, we see that there is enhancement of the pericardium circumferentially, and it is quite uh, significant. As uh, one of my mentors says, the pericardium looks angry. And so that tells us that there is edema of the pericardium here, indicating active inflammation. And late gadolinium enhancement images also reveal circumferential LGE of the pericardium, um, indicating active inflammation. These are fat-suppressed, water-activated, face-sensitive inversion recovery sequences of the same patient. And that also shows that perid pericardial enhancement throughout, indicating um, that the patient has active pericarditis. So cardiac MRI can be used to assess for pericardial disease. And other chest pain syndromes that can be investigated include Minoka. Um, so this was a 40-year-old female who had presented to the ED with chest pain. Um, she had had a coronary angiogram, which showed no obstructive coronary artery disease, no evidence of dissection um, and no pathology. She was then referred for a cardiac MRI. And what we are seeing here is that there is transmural late gadolinium enhancement in the mid to apical segments, indicative of an infarct in that area. So that led to a diagnosis of MI with non-obstructive coronary artery disease. You can also have myocarditis. Uh, this was a patient who was, I think, late 20s, who had a parvovirus B19 infection and then developed chest pain about a week after, came in and was referred for a cardiac MRI. Um, these are representative late gadolinium enhancement uh, images, and we can see that there is significant dense late gadolinium enhancement in the mid to subepicardial myocardium. The subendocardium, uh, the endocardium is spared by, as seen by this dark rim over here, and that indicates that this patient has active myocarditis. Cardiac MRI can also be used for valve assessment. Um, so this is a 46-year-old asymptomatic female who was incidentally found to have bicuspid aortic valve. Um, she had mild dilation of the ascending aorta, had a moderately dilated LV, and was referred for a cardiac MRI for further evaluation of the valve and the LV structure and function, as well as the degree of uh, regurgitation. 
These are uh, cine images seen on the screen over here on the left side. You see that the LV is dilated, it is globular. The aortic valve leaflets appear mildly thickened. There is some flow acceleration across the valve. And then on the right side, you see the, the Mercedes Benz view of the aortic valve, which shows you that the left and right coronary cusps are fused. This is a bicuspid aortic valve. And then we measured aortic flow across the valve. So this is cutting across the aortic valve, uh, just above the aortic valve level. We measured the magnitude of flow as well as the direction of flow. And that allows us to quantify um, the degree of aortic regurgitation. So once we got acquired those images and that data, we quantified the forward flow as well as the backward flow. And the forward flow volume in this case was 217 ml. The backward flow volume in this case quantified out to be 106 ml with a regurgitant fraction of 49%, indicating that this patient had severe aortic insufficiency. So a key point is that cardiac MRI can be used to quantify valvular disease. And this same principle can be extended to mitral valve, to the pulmonary valve, and then also can be extended to assess the significance of shunts. These are flow qualification curves from a female with an atrial septal defect. Um, and we wanted to uh, evaluate the significance of that shunt um, due to AST. So we got forward flow through the aorta. We also got forward flow through the pulmonary valve. And the forward flow volume in this case was 78 ml. The backward flow volume in this case was 77 ml. And that uh, we got, we took the ratio of the pulmonary flow to the systemic flow, which gave us a QPQS ratio of 1.0, indicating that the shunt was not hemodynamically significant. So overall, cardiac MRI is a very useful diagnostic tool um, for women. It can be used to investigate the etiology of cardiomyopathy. It can be used for ischemia assessment. It can be used for viability assessment, pericardial disease assessment, myocardial injury assessment, valvular disease, shunt assessment. It can be used for myocardial tissue characterization in a variety of settings if you want to assess for metastatic disease to the heart, if you want to assess for cardiac masses. Um, I did not show you cases for those in the interest of time, but there is a slew of applications in cardiac MRI as a useful diagnostic tool in women. I want to take a minute to acknowledge uh, my mentors who have taught me everything I know, as well as the wonderful cardiovascular imaging department here that I work with. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. Thank you so much, doctor. And so uh, I want to invite to Professor Lale Tokyozolo. Hello, Professor. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in uh, both genders, but I'd like to sp uh, focus on uh, women and how this is reflected in the guidelines. Uh, according to the most recent uh, European cardiovascular disease statistics, cardiovascular disease is the cause of 45% of deaths in females and 39% in males. And as you can see here, middle income countries are affected more, especially women in middle income countries have the highest death rates. And the gap opens here if you look at proportion of deaths below age 70, uh, which is seen most in uh, middle income country females. And we thought that uh, cardiovascular disease was a male problem. The atherosclerotic vascular disease ch face is changing. Instead of the male smoker, now we're getting women, younger individuals, and people from middle income countries are the main group that are affected with this disease. There are differences in risk factors where some risk factors such as obesity, diabetes, inactivity, and psychosocial stress are more frequent in women as well as inflammation. There are also uh, risk factors that have a stronger destructive impact on women such as smoking, diabetes, and psychosocial factors. We know well the well-established risk factors, but we also need to take into consideration sex-specific risk factors. And what is often neglected and under-recognized are the psychosocial factors 
intimate partner violence, socioeconomic deprivation, poor health literacy, and environmental risk factors. We have seen that the COVID pandemic has had a higher impact on women than in men. And the huge interheart study showed us that the population attributable risk for lifestyle factors is significantly higher in women. In young women, oral contraceptive use, early menopause or ovarian insufficiency all increase cardiovascular risk. During pregnancy, diabetes, hypertension, preeclampsia, or fertility therapy are uh, problematic. And in older women, hormone replacement therapy and menopause both increase the risk of females. This was not recognized in the guidelines until very recently. In the 2021 Cardiovascular Prevention Guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology, uh, for the first time as a class 2B indication, all these conditions are acknowledged as well as trying to avoid combining hormonal contraceptives in women with migraine with aura. So as we learn more, this information is becoming more and more integrated into the guidelines, but not sufficiently so. For example, the risk estimation charts we see, see in the guidelines underestimate the risk in women, where low absolute risk may conceal a high relative risk. To overcome this, we can use a relative risk chart, use risk modifiers and imaging. The recent European guidelines do not recommend biomarkers uh, for determining risk, but we know that inflammation is a major problem in women and high sensitivity CRP may add to the risk. And uh, the US and Can Canadian guidelines do acknowledge the use of high sensitivity CRP in intermediate risk patients. The MISA study taught us that coronary artery calcium is related to events and a higher calcium score in women uh, confers a higher risk than men. And in the coronary artery calcium consortium in 66,000 patients, it was seen that coronary artery calcium predicts mortality better in women, but this is not reflected in the guidelines. Recently, the Dankeva study, a huge uh, study on imaging, was uh, presented in the European Society of Cardiology meeting. But in this large study, there were no women. So if there had been some women, it may have given us some insight about how to use imaging, different types of imaging in women. It has also already been discussed that women have a greater symptom burden, higher rate of functional disability, and less obstructive disease. But if they do have obstructive disease, adverse outcomes are higher. They seek attention later, they're underdiagnosed and undertreated. And in addition to the plaque rupture, uh, plaque erosion is seen more frequently uh, in women, and usually there is more distal embolization during an acute coronary syndrome. Ainuka in women has been well discussed, and in these patients, although the coronary angiography is normal, I was made some show some plaque and microvascular dysfunction may be diagnosed by sophisticated methods. But how can we discriminate and personalize treatment in these patients? The guidelines are only recommending risk factor modification, but we also know that in addition to dyslipidemia, smoking and diabetes, hypoestrogenemia, inflammatory milieu, mental stress and depression all may contribute to INOCA. Uh, myocardial infarction with normal coronaries is also seen more frequently in women, and we have to make sure that we uh, look for the other causes and do a proper differential diagnosis before we start treating these patients. Dyslipidemia in women is another problem. Women with high LDL cholesterol have their treatment interrupted during pregnancy and lactation, and if this is a patient with familial hypercholesterolemia, this will have major clinical implications. All the guideline recommendations on dyslipidemia uh, treatment we have are on randomized trials done mostly in men. The Helsinki Heart Study had no women. The West of Scotland Study had no women. There has been a typing error here, but the Forest Study had only 15% women. And most of the lipid-lowering trials have about 25% uh, 
uh, women enrolled. With menopause and aging, uh, lipid levels uh, are usually uh, worsened, where triglycerides, VLDL, total cholesterol, LDL is increased, and small dense LDL is increased. We have recently uh, come to learn that LP LA is increased about 10% in menopause. And although the guidelines recommend LP measurement once in a lifetime, for women, it should be twice in a lifetime, something we have uh, addressed uh, in the recent consensus paper on LP LA of the European Atherosclerosis Society. Statin associated muscle symptoms are seen more in women. In a large meta-analysis of 17 studies in 4 million patients, it was demonstrated that women, and especially older women, have more statin-associated muscle symptoms than men. And dyslipidemia in women is undertreated. They're less likely to be put on a statin, uh, even offered a statin, but when offered, more likely to decline and not adhere well to the treatment. Five de days ago, in the American College of Cardiology meeting, clear outcome study was uh, announced. In 14,000 statin intolerant patients, LDL lowering and major cardiovascular uh, event reduction occurred with bempedoic acids. The fact that this was the first huge randomized trial with 48% women got a huge uh, a uh, clap from the audience when it was announced because finally we have a large randomized trial that has enrolled enough women for us to make a conclusion. But we clearly need more randomized trials with equal representation from women. Response to therapy in women may be different because of the lower body weight, higher proportion of fat, different endogenous hormone levels, and differences in enzyme activities involved in drug metabolism and lower GFR. So we need to be careful. For example, uh, aspirin in, uh, for atherosclerosis prevention in women is slightly different. Yes, we give it to all secondary prevention uh, patients, and we don't give it to most primary prevention patients. But in primary prevention, if the female is a smoker, has a high calcium score, familial hypercholesterolemia, suboptimally controlled risk factors or a high risk, then they may benefit from aspirin, especially if their bleeding risk is low. Because of the lack of uh, addressing these factors, consensus papers such as the Lancet Commission's paper and others are emer emerging from different groups. And uh, they look at these excess risks and try to find strategic solutions for these specific problems, as this uh, consensus uh, that was published in the European Heart Journal last year. Also, uh, problems with the procedure, uh, treatments, higher morbidities should uh, be anticipated in women and uh, should uh, be addressed with caution. So to summarize, women compared with men are less likely to receive guideline uh, recommended uh, treatments or appropriate intensification of therapy. And the result of the impact of uh, gap in this care is increased mortality or morbidity due to MI, heart failure, bypass grafting, and angina. To overcome this problem, we need more trials with female representation so that this can be reflected on the guidelines. And the fact that women adhere less to all medications is becoming a big problem. And more research on adherence, which is becoming uh, a science in itself, is necessary so that all this can be uh, reflected to the newer guidelines that we are going to write. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, doctor. Um, okay, this is the end of the, our webinar. Uh, dear professors, doctors, and our listeners, uh, first of all, on behalf of the Adrian Center of Excellence, to our strong and successful doctors uh, who don't leave us alone um, on our Women in Cardiology webinar and agree to speak, agree to be a speaker also, uh, I would like to thank you, our listening, listeners uh, who support 
us by watching for their participations. Uh, as an ADN Center, of, ADN Center of Excellence, we believe in the power of our doctors who guide the future and we support them. We, we support them. Uh, we, uh, we, we will always support the presence and strength of the women, women in a developing and changing world. Uh, in addition to this, uh, I would like to tell, uh, tell to you that my achievements as a man uh, working with the women have inspired me. Uh, this is our first webinar, but it won't be the last. Um, we would like, we will be honored to have a, have have you among us in um, our our other webinar. So uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, who participate and who speak to this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for attending. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Shabu.